Section 15 of Wellington by George Hooper. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 10. Diplomatist and Statesman, Part 1. Before Wellington sailed from the continent in the autumn of 1818, he had accepted the office of Master General of the Ordnance with a seat in Lord Liverpool's cabinet. The England to which he returned was neither peaceful nor prosperous. She was exhausted by the long war, her rulers increased the distress by pursuing selfish objects, and it is not surprising that her people were riotous and discontented. Happily the Master General was not called upon to take an active part in maintaining order, but his advice was sought and given. He busied himself in improving his estate at his own cost, having a profound conviction on which he always acted that property has its duties as well as its rights. He spent his entire rental upon the land from which it was derived, draining and fencing, building new cottages, providing large gardens, he held that a laborer should have one acre of land, and promoting the comfort of his tenants to such a degree as to draw praise from censorious Cobbett himself. In dealing with his office, he unearthed the arrangements of James the Second, a weak fellow, but a good man of business. Finding they were excellent, the Duke brought the department back very much to what he had made it, a remarkable fact preserved by Lord Stanhope. The accession of George the Fourth in 1820 brought to a head the long-standing quarrel between that personage and his wife. The sins of both were notorious, but the new king was so unpopular that the people, including all ranks, made a heroine of the queen. With her the duke had no sympathy, but he disapproved of the proceedings initiated behind the backs of his ministers by the king, and only tacitly acquiesced in those pursued in Parliament. At a critical moment, when the bill of pains and penalties had been read a third time by a small majority, and not passed but postponed for six months, he submitted a memorandum to the king, pointing out the peril of pushing the matter further. If it were pushed, inquiry by both houses was inevitable, an inquiry, he boldly said, in which not the Queen, but your Majesty, yourself, and your English and Hanoverian servants, and the servants of the Duchy of Cornwall, and those employed by them, will be put on their trial. That memorandum was effectual, apparently, but nothing more was done, and the King did not even try to change a ministry which failed to satisfy his anger. The Duke was made Lord High Constable, and as such took part in the coronation. It is commonly said that Queen Caroline was refused admission to Westminster Abbey, but the cabinet decided that she could not be excluded from an open ceremony. A place was reserved for her among the peeresses, and it was she who refused to enter the abbey and sit with them. The Duke's part in bringing about the convulsion, as Canning called it, which shook the kingdom was slight and always on the moderating side, and he reminded the king that every evil which had occurred in the course of the inquiry was foreseen and foretold by ministers, who, however, which he does not say, could not muster courage to oppose the royal will. In fact, the only minister who resigned was Canning. The king was furious, but the offence was not mortal, for within two years, chiefly through the influence of Wellington, Canning, on the death of Lord Londonderry, became Secretary of State for Foreign Affairs. Before that event occurred, the Duke accompanied his sovereign to Belgium in 1821, and was his guide over the field of Waterloo. The King listened to his explanations, but showed no special interest, or took it coolly, as the Duke said, until he came to the grave of Lord Anglesey's leg, and then he burst into tears. He could sympathize at least, with the loss of a handsome limb. There was a general peace in Europe, but the continent was not peaceful. The empires and kingdoms were no longer at war with each other, but more or less the people were at war with the emperors and kings. Greece was in open revolt, the Janissaries overawed the Sultan, the Neapolitans obtained a temporary mastery over their monarch, and the Spaniards held their king in practical duress. Then the Holy Alliance came into play in a notably worldly fashion. 
it was supposed at the time and may be still that the british government was subservient to a sanctimonious confederacy invented by the emperor alexander but even his brothers of austria and prussia who signed the treaty because they did not wish to offend him thought he was affected in his mind so far as the british ministers were concerned they had nothing to do with what castlereagh described as a piece of sublime mysticism and nonsense which alexander himself laid before him the duke of wellington he wrote happened to be with me when the emperor called and it was not without difficulty that we went through the interview with becoming gravity the holy alliance although england had no share in it was a real force enough when the neapolitans broke into insurrection the british government stood out for non-interference which was always wellington's doctrine and declined to be party to austrian intervention the internal conflicts in spain placed them in still greater hostility to the plans of the holy allies to determine what should be done a congress was held at verona and wellington was sent thither to represent his country how he bore himself may be read in his dispatches but he only carried out strictly the policy of his colleagues and his own lord liverpool writing to canning before the congress met said that even if a change of dynasty were brought about in spain it would be no ground for hostile interference by the powers and that the conduct and character of king ferdinand made even the personal question the weakest he ever recollected in a case of revolution wellington at verona informed the emperor of russia that with us it had become a principle not to interfere in the internal affairs of any country excepting in a case of necessity and that this principle did not grow out of our parliamentary constitution but ought to be the guide of all governments be their constitutions what they might nothing can be plainer or more consistent with the entire course of wellington's career he told the emperor at a later period that in his anxiety to fight the revolutionists he had left one ally out of his calculation which is it alexander asked i replied time time would remedy many of the evils complained of as resulting from the spanish and other revolutions but if that remedy were awaited said alexander the bon gens and royalists would be lost and so they parted the truth is that the ultra royalists led by the comte d'artois and m de chateaubriand were bent on invading spain in order to fly the french flag and gather glory for the restoration respecting the heir to the throne wellington in eighteen eighteen uttered some prophetic words the descendants of louis the fifteenth he wrote will not reign in france and i must say and always will say that it is the fault of monsieur and his adherents it was they who forced on the spanish war of invasion and it was they who ceased to reign in eighteen thirty the congress of verona was the grand climacteric of the holy alliance and it expired almost before the death of its projector and patron the emperor alexander one picturesque little fact outside the gloomy arena of politics which occurred in the ancient city has been preserved among strange scenes few were stranger than that of wellington and the empress maria louisa mother of the sometime king of rome playing at ecarte and paying each other in napoleons she was grateful to the duke for winning waterloo because in eighteen fifteen she had a lover who afterwards became her husband and she was not in a condition to return with safety to her imperial spouse returning to england in the beginning of eighteen twenty three the duke was obliged to defend and did defend with point and vigour the course pursued by himself as the agent of the government at verona there was a strong desire in some quarters to take part with the spaniards a desire which even those who felt it would have repressed had they been in office we have seen what the policy was how it was adverse to the domineering views of the holy alliance and failed only because england by reason alone could not prevail and disclaimed the idea of using force on either side it is instructive to observe that all parties were under the delusion that the french invasion of spain would strengthen the bourbon monarchy a delusion entertained by the french themselves 
for as it was one of the causes which led to the ultimate expulsion of charles x wellington's course in the matter was honest and above board and the sharp criticism showered upon him must be set down mainly to party exigencies as well as parliamentary custom canning more impatient and defiant than the duke who never indulged in threats longed to speak out his mind to the french but it was not until four years afterwards that he uttered the famous sentence i called the new world into existence to redress the balance of the old being determined that if france had spain she should not have spain and the indies the difference between the duke and his colleague regarding the recognition of the spanish colonies was one of degree not principle canning wished to do the thing at once the duke as usual favoured moderation yet even he slow to move in such a matter saw that recognition must come only he would have gone no further than was necessary but have had each case determined on its merits at verona where the subject was discussed he carefully left it in such a state that his government might do what it pleased if canning did not exactly call the new world into existence since it had been more or less much alive since the beginning of the peninsular war he did call up something else the monroe doctrine can claim him as its parent for he suggested the declaration to mr rush at verona wellington succeeded in averting a war between russia and turkey which threatened the general peace and alexander went home a sadder if not a wiser man toward the end of eighteen twenty five he died rather suddenly at taganrog and his brother nicholas by virtue of a family compact reigned in his stead wellington was dispatched to st petersburg on the accession of the new emperor which gave him an opportunity of ascertaining if possible the intentions of the czar toward greece and turkey he was soon involved in a diplomatic tussle not only with nesselroda but with the emperor also and in the end he could do no more than defer for a time the meditated attack on the sultan and obtain a protocol having for its object a peaceful settlement of the acute greek difficulty on a basis suggested by the russians themselves the time was now at hand when he would be summoned to take a more prominent position in the state so far as office went george the fourth made the duke constable of the tower in eighteen twenty six and when the death of the duke of york early in the next year left vacant the post of commander-in-chief it was at once bestowed on the field marshal who announced his appointment to the army with characteristic simplicity and brevity he was now in his right place but fate decided that he should not remain in it long lord liverpool prime minister since eighteen twelve fell hopelessly ill and in april the king sending for canning empowered him in the usual way to reconstruct the ministry on the principles which guided that of lord liverpool i need not add canning said in writing to the duke how essentially the accomplishment of his task must depend upon your grace's continuance as a member of the cabinet in reply to the obliging proposition the duke desired to know who was to be the prime minister and the answer was in brief mr canning who added that he had laid the letters before the king thereupon observing that he thought mr canning with the best intentions would not be able to hold fast the liverpool principles the duke declined to join him and followed up his refusal by resigning the offices of commander-in-chief and master-general of the ordnance the duke was vehemently censured for his conduct but it should be observed that he had no confidence in canning who himself had no right political or moral to the cooperation of wellington during the ministry of the brilliant orator the king affected for three months to command the army the duke of clarence became lord high admiral and russian influences so far prevailed in the cabinet that the protocol of st petersburg was converted into a vague treaty which led to the battle of navarino and forwarded russian aggression quite as much as greek emancipation lord godrich afterwards earl of ripon succeeded canning but he could not hold his colleagues together and in january eighteen twenty eight the king sent for the duke and made him his prime minister he did not seek the office in eighteen twenty seven he said that he should be 
worse than mad to think of such a thing but when requested by the king he took the post as he had taken others holding himself to be as he always put it the retained servant of the crown it is in this light that we must regard his assumption of a great responsibility an office for which he said he was not qualified yet was really far more qualified than many other men the canningites joined the government and although the emperor nicholas seeing his opportunity made war on turkey the duke loyally carried out the treaty negotiated by canning with the policy of which personally he so strongly disagreed but he never would consent to be the mere leader of a party he was always the servant of the state and kept its compacts that conviction of his duty was finally illustrated when he had to deal with the roman catholic question ireland as he believed especially after the election of o'connell for clare was on the verge of civil war and what civil war is he well knew moreover it was his fixed opinion that whenever the consent of the crown could be obtained the question could be settled personally no religious prejudice withheld him from enfranchising the roman catholics his opposition rested on broad and deep political grounds but when the tide of opinion in both islands rose to a dangerous height looking only to the common weal and setting aside his personal bias he boldly told the truth to the king and secured his needed consent he remarked long afterwards that justice would not be done to his action in settling the vexatious dispute until his communications to the king were published and those documents now accessible to all are his justification they and all his writings on his native country show that he did not at any time blink the facts which underlay its unhappy condition if he were stern in requiring obedience to law he did not spare the gentlemen of ireland whose treatment of their landed estates and neglect of their duties were so repugnant to his conscience and opposed to his practice dreading a civil war as one who knew what it was he strove to avert the calamity and fortunately did not strive in vain how thoroughly he had gauged the dangers lurking in the whole question may be judged from the fact that in one of his earliest letters to the king he foresaw the possibility i might state it more strongly he says of the roman catholic tenantry refusing to pay tithes or rents the clergy and the landlords might have recourse to the law but how is the law to be enforced how can they distrain for rent or tithes on millions of tenants he said it would probably be the first measure of resistance and rebellion the words testified to his prescience but the measures foreseen were not attempted until he had been many years in his grave one might think that the men who set them in motion not for their own sake but as means to obtain an independent parliament had studied and caught up their schemes from the duke's writings he has been taunted with inconsistency because he brought his great influence to bear on all who were opposed to roman catholic emancipation but no act of his life was in stricter accord with the fundamental principles governing his conduct early in the struggle with the king he said it is the duty of all to look our difficulties in the face and to lay the ground for getting the better of them he had no fixed hostility to the concession that it had been so long delayed was not his fault and when he saw that it would deliver the country from a civil war he thought it high time that the concession should be made he was right in doubting whether it would pacify ireland which he had long seen aimed at independence but whether it would or not the contest with rebellion would be less arduous politics has been called the science of exigencies and in this exigency the duke keeping the permanent interests of the united kingdom in view did what he believed was best for them it was an act of expediency and he certainly would never have set it upon what some would call a higher level in like manner he acquiesced to the repeal of the test and corporation acts a futile remnant of exclusiveness which the legislature had to nullify every year by an indemnity act the passing of these measures was accomplished because the prime minister of the day was not a party man three considerable episodes two serious and one comic 
enlivened the stormy period of the duke's administration the comic episode grew out of the pretensions of the duke of clarence lord high admiral he took on himself to hoist his flag in the thames summon his board to portsmouth set forth in command of a squadron all in excess of his powers under the law the duke courteously but firmly remonstrated even the king declared his brother hopelessly in the wrong and in the end the lord high admiral unable to prevail resigned but he bore no malice for after defying his board or council he ended up shaking hands and asking them all to dinner at bushy another disturbing influence of a grimmer kind was the duke of cumberland and the constant troubles wrung from wellington a cry of impatience between the king and his brothers he wrote to peel the government of this country has become a most heart-breaking concern another trial was more grave mr huskisson thought fit to vote against his government and immediately to give the duke an opportunity of placing his office in other hands the duke took him at his word but mr huskisson did not mean to resign he meant to draw forth a request that he should stay the duke convinced that it was not with one individual but a party that he had to deal would not entreat and so mr huskisson went out of office and all the canningites with him principles were paraded but they were not at stake the duke said that he could not get a definition or clear idea of whig tory liberal or mr canning's principles adding in a pregnant passage this i know that this country was never governed in practice according to the extreme principles of any party whatever much less according to the extremes which other opposing parties attribute to their adversaries the canningites were replaced and took their share out of the government in passing the measure so long supported alike by castlereagh and canning roman catholic emancipation End of section 15. Section 16 of Wellington by George Hooper. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 10 Diplomatist and Statesman, Part 2. The third episode sprang armed out of the heat of the desperate conflict the old tories never forgave the duke for his desertion as they called it and lord winchelsea wrote and published a letter in which he accused the duke of having long used a show of zeal for the protestant religion as a cloak under which he might carry out his insidious designs for the introduction of popery the insult was poignant and as after repeated attempts to obtain it full reparation was refused the duke demanded satisfaction probably lord winchelsea never expected that he would be called to account so sharply and was astonished when he found that his victim turned upon him but he would not yield except on the ground although he went to battersea fields with a determination not to fire at the duke and when he had stood fire to express his regret so the duel passed wellington fired wide winchelsea in the air and an apology was given in writing on the ground and publicly the duke was a dangerous man to trifle with but it is notable that he had never been out before and did not possess any duelling pistols the duke however always held that he was bound to act as he did lord winchelsea he said to mr gligan after years did his best to establish the principle that a man in my situation must be a traitor unless he adheres through thick and thin to a policy once advocated his attack on me was part of a plan to render the conduct of public affairs impossible to the king's servants and thus the admission that he was wrong had to be extorted from him nor should it be forgotten that the duke took up the libel as a public matter writing a few weeks afterwards he said that the duel was as much a part of the catholic question as anything else he was obliged to do he was living in an atmosphere of calumny after the hostile meeting the air was cleared and if the event itself shocked many good men still it was necessary in the public interests and none can say it was not effective in staying the evil 
throughout the whole contest with the king the duke of cumberland the levants and the old tories he was determined to carry the business and also to fight the battle in his own way how much he felt at times is shown by his passionate outbursts in private when the strain became too severe or the scenes at windsor too distressing even for his patience if i had known in january eighteen twenty eight he wrote in november eighteen twenty nine one tithe of what i do now and of what i discovered one month after i was in office i should never have been the king's minister and should have avoided loads of misery i believe there never was a man who suffered so much and for so little purpose an extravagant picture perhaps yet who can say what a man so straightforward and honest must have endured during nearly three years of office from the kind of people with whom he had to deal not only if mainly in conducting home affairs in a troubled time but in working out a foreign policy left him as a legacy and in thwarting as far as he could the designs of the russian emperor and his unscrupulous agents of both sexes the hope he expressed in november eighteen twenty nine that he might soon be relieved from the unhappy lot which had befallen him was gratified a year later when after the accession of william the fourth the revolution of july was the signal for an imperative demand for the reform of parliament the whigs saw their chance the old tories bent only on a policy of revenge gratified their rancor regardless of anything else in november eighteen thirty the wellington administration defeated on a side issue ceased to be and the duke got rid of his heavy burden although outvoted on the question of referring the civil list to a committee it was parliamentary reform and tory rancor which killed the duke's government not that he was hostile to gradual change such as the transfer of seats from corrupt boroughs to great towns had his advice prevailed birmingham would have sent members to parliament long before eighteen thirty two he had as keen a contempt for the boroughmongers as cobbett himself and spoke with indignation of their conduct in selling seats to the highest bidder which vile in itself was also the abuse of a great trust the close boroughs he considered should have been used to bring able men of all shades of political opinion into parliament so as to produce a genuine representation not of numbers but of character and intellect but the boroughmongers were as faithless to their obligations as the absentee landlords in ireland and all landlords who looking only to their convenience or gains neglected the duties incumbent on them as owners of landed property this was the more grievous to him because he held the doctrine that the constitution had a territorial basis and that one of its foundation stones was the influence of real property when people talked to him of the rights of the aristocracy he said he knew nothing of them the peers have rights and privileges under the constitution but out of doors the peers are no more than others of her majesty's subjects except that they are exempt from arrest have titles of honour and rank and precedence in society in short what he dreaded was a democratic parliament which would be in its nature hostile to the great institutions of the country and the essential interests of the society called the british empire what he failed to see was that a change was coming if it had not come over the nation which made the representative machinery of eighteen thirty incompatible with peaceful national life that the pivot of power had at last begun to shift from land to trade commerce and industry and that the claim of these to share in power could not be denied nor is he to be blamed for that still less for standing up steadfastly in defence of his convictions i feel no strength he said excepting in my character for plain manly dealing and he could not pretend to say he approved of measures which he passed or those he abstained from opposing when he did not love them he fought the sweeping whig reform bill as long as he could he tried to form a government against it he strove to modify when he could not reject it but he announced his intention of absenting himself from the house of peers so soon as he saw that the national safety could only be preserved by the passing of the bill then he frankly accepted it as the law of the land and hoped that the inevitable changes would be brought about so slowly as to mitigate their effects 
he has been soundly rated for half a century because he made an imprudent declaration against a special measure of reform it is a testimony to his worth and his candour should have been appreciated but simplicity frankness and plain manly dealing do not serve the interests of political parties or leaders of parties the duke as it seems to us was not by his character fitted for the work which they perform he was never a mere party man or party leader he was always the devoted servant of the crown and the state and the really astonishing thing is that he remained in office for nearly three years nothing but his high character kept him there and it was his high character which finally expelled him he belonged to the pre-democratic era just going below the horizon in eighteen thirty two he did not quail before the multitude nor mistake the quality of their cheers or groans when apsley house was threatened he was prepared to defend it by force when the windows were broken he put up iron shutters and never took them down nor did he ever fail to point to them on occasions when crowds saluted him with hurrahs he was beset by a furious mob on the anniversary of waterloo in eighteen thirty two when riding home from the mint and owed his life perhaps to the accident that he had an appointment in lincoln's inn where the lawyers gallantly provided for his safety the incident is ever memorable as a shining example of popular fickleness and folly one can imagine the scene as he rode at a walking pace out of the inn through the howling mob pale but with a severe countenance immovable on his saddle and looking straight before him sir edward sugden and another barrister forming the advance guard in this striking procession yet at this very moment the reform bill had become the reform act and its final passage through the house of lords was really effected by the prudence and wisdom of the man so bitterly assailed and outraged but all mobs behave alike when under the influence of ignorance and passion whether clad in broadcloth or fustian and none knew that better than the duke who never allowed either to drive him from the course marked out for him by his sense of duty that he could and did put aside his personal convictions for the common good is true but to physical threats and the imminence of personal danger he never yielded one jot the story of the reform bill is now ancient history yet no generous mind can study it without recognizing the honourable and manly conduct of a statesman whose first and last thought was for his country and never for himself that is why with a standpoint so different party men who wanted to and did admire him could never quite understand or calculate his course the political crisis in the winter of eighteen thirty four through eighteen thirty five which was preceded by that somewhat astonishing incident the selection of the duke as chancellor of the university of oxford affords another illustration the first government of lord melbourne from the action of causes to which we cannot even allude suddenly disappeared one november morning the duke was at strathfield say and was just going out hunting when a king's messenger arrived from brighton at six in the morning bearing a summons from king william thither the duke hastened at once and when the king told him that he had no ministry he at once recommended his majesty to send for sir robert peel and as sir robert was in italy the duke offered to carry on the government until the wandering statesman reached england the king assented and the duke was immediately appointed first lord of the treasury and sworn in as secretary of state for the home department which enabled him to act in all the other offices nothing could be more astounding to the ordinary party mind except the promptitude with which a man who always went straight for the thing to be done entered on his collective functions the same day november seventeenth he went direct to the home office did business looked in at the other offices and assumed his place making no changes but doing the work to be done sir robert was summoned home by express and despite the wishes of the king no appointment was made until he arrived thus to the astonishment amusement and admiration of the public the duke for three weeks conducted what he laughingly called his dictatorship in complete accordance with the constitution he fixed his headquarters at the home office and then sallied forth to perform his functions in the others 
sir erskine may regards the expedient as one of a doubtful and anomalous character adding that as the duke had exercised the extraordinary powers entrusted to him with honour and good faith he was not subjected to parliamentary censure even at a time when the temper of the house of commons was so inflamed in short the duke spoke truly when he said that he had not disposed of a single office nor done any act not essentially necessary for the service of the king and the country it was a novel experience for the parties who divided the state and certainly raised the duke in general estimation if they did not understand the motive which actuated him as a public servant they appreciated the courage of the man who took all the responsibility and none of the patronage who suddenly found the king without a government and at once supplied one in his own person peel returned to london in december and forming a ministry in the usual way gave the foreign office to the duke parliament was dissolved but the appeal to the country did no more than reinforce the conservatives who beaten on successive divisions resigned in april the duke's share in the labours of this brief administration is remarkable for two things it was necessary to appoint a new ambassador to st petersburg and the duke selected lord londonderry he never even started for his post so huge an uproar was raised in and out of parliament by the opposition that he retired it was a pure bit of party fighting and had nothing to do with the sole thing that animated the minister in selecting him his fitness mr greville reporting the duke's conversation at the time has this significant entry he said he was not particularly partial to the man nor ever had been but that he was very fit for the post and was an excellent ambassador procured more information and obtained more insight into the affairs of a foreign court than anybody and that he was the best relater of what passed at a conference and wrote the best account of a conversation of any man he knew so that the fit man was sacrificed to party animosity and nothing else it will be seen that in making this selection imprudent from a party point of view because it gave the opposition a pretext the error of the duke consisted of looking about for the man best fitted to do the work of an ambassador which one might have supposed was precisely the duty of a foreign secretary but the duke never could be got to regulate his conduct on the curious and artificial rules of the politician who was bound to think first of himself and his party the other incident of his ministry redounded to his honour in a different way the horrible cruelties practised by each side in the carlist wars moved him to dispatch lord elliot to spain with instructions to bring both within the area of civilization he was successful in his efforts the slaughter of prisoners was stayed and their treatment regulated by the elliot convention it did not long endure but it was an attempt to make civil war humane and deserved a longer sway although the duke of wellington was included in the cabinet formed by peel in eighteen forty one and eighteen forty six he never again held any political office his function was to lead in the house of lords and holding that position he so acted as to moderate opposition and help the ministers whenever he could he has himself in a letter to lord stanley eighteen forty six when pressing him to assume the leadership described the principles on which he conducted his management of the upper house for twenty years he objected to all extreme and violent measures of opposition supported the government on important occasions used his influence to prevent the mischief of anything like a difference or division between the two houses he endeavoured to guide and did guide opinion in the peers and induced them to do what he thought best for the crown the constitution and the country his last political service was in joining sir robert peel to abolish the corn laws much against his personal wish and when that dangerous question came to a head he wrote a letter to the queen severing his connection with the conservative party which made him anxious that lord stanley should take his place and do as he had done it is impossible he writes for me to do otherwise than is indicated in my letter to the queen i am the servant of the crown and people i have been paid and rewarded and consider myself retained and that i can't do otherwise than serve as required when i can do so without dishonour that is to say as long as i have health and strength to enable me to serve 
the principle which determined his course in eighteen forty five and forty six was one now familiar to us from him the question to be considered when sir robert peel undertook to do what lord john russell would not attempt he said was not what the corn laws should be but whether the queen should have a government or as he told crocker the position he had taken up was not on the corn law his object was to maintain a government in the country that position after long years came to be well understood by the public and the knowledge of it finally extinguished every idea that the duke was a high tory or even a party man a dictator or a mere soldier he was in his political as well as in his military character preeminently a great national servant always intent on promoting what according to his cool judgment was best for the common weal End of section sixteen section seventeen of wellington by george hooper this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by pamela nagami chapter eleven old age if the duke of wellington were twenty or thirty years younger he ought to be on horseback and on the field with runjeet singh instead of being called in to arrange the affairs of maids of honour and the palace was his remark to lord stanhope in march eighteen thirty nine two years later george broadfoot shut up in jellalabad wrote set the duke down at ferozepore with carte blanche both contempt of the enemy and timidity would disappear and afghanistan would soon be our own to keep or abandon the dream of the valiant young soldier of course could not be realized his hero was and felt himself to be too old his deafness the result of improper treatment became yearly worse and he had suffered from those severe attacks of illness which made o'connell chuckle over the thought that one of whom he was always afraid would soon die the death of lord hill in eighteen forty two made wellington commander-in-chief by patent and for life all remember how when the news of chilianwalla filled men with dismay asked to submit three names to the government as fit successors to sir hugh gough he wrote down thrice sir charles napier still more does it dwell in the memory that he fixed the resolution of sir charles by saying if you will not go i must that was an appeal which could not be withstood later still the old fire blazed up when he undertook to thwart the chartists on april tenth eighteen forty eight and kept his word so well and made such solid arrangements that tranquillity was preserved without showing a soldier or firing a shot well duke it has all turned out as you foretold said sir john campbell oh yes was the reply i was sure of it and i never showed a soldier or musket but i was ready i could have stopped them wherever you liked and if they had been armed it would have been all the same that was his last military triumph and he was pardonably elated at its bloodless success few living can remember him as he was in the prime of his manhood but many cherish the recollection of the silver-haired veteran wearing a blue coat and white waistcoat and trousers riding or walking through the streets or painfully listening with one hand to his best ear in the house of lords age slowly sapped his strength music which he so loved was lost to him and he had to give up his hunting but he rose early worked as of old and neglected no duty if he became irritable and had his quick temper less under control that was due to failing powers and he was painfully conscious of the weakness it was only trifles that moved him on grave subjects he was patient and ready to bear with opposition all his life but no man is so privileged as to escape human infirmity the publication of his dispatches by colonel gurwood raised him immensely in public estimation and he was seen as he was for the first time one might say that despite the splendour of his active military career and the enthusiasm it aroused men did not come to know him truly until he had grown old and then admiration passed into a sort of reverence which shed a halo over his declining years baron stockmar having said that he was one-sided prince albert answered 
he is a fresh illustration of the truth that to achieve great results and do great deeds a certain one-sidedness is essential certainly it is better to be a wellington than a hamlet the nation agreed with queen victoria when she said he was the pride and the genius as it were of the country how true the phrase is was shown when his startling letter to sir john burgoyne was printed from his watch-tower at walmer he looked around and saw that the south of england was defenceless and said so in plain terms the nation was electrified and from that day in eighteen forty eight may be dated the modern measures for the defence of our coast and the reinforcement of our army the warning came with triple energy from one who had been always a votary of real economy and a fervid champion of peace it was he who wrote in eighteen forty one may god preserve the general peace man will not if left to himself throughout his life he was generous and gave without stint his conduct towards alava offers a conspicuous example even cobbett who called him an old ruffian found that the duke was not a miser he carried loose sovereigns in his pocket to bestow on any of his old soldiers in distress when general brenier captured at vimiero was prisoner sir arthur as he then was lent the frenchman five hundred pounds which was never repaid he was absolutely unostentatious in giving mr gleig once saw a private record of his charities which in one year reached four thousand pounds he was the cheerful victim of impostors and even delinquents saying when rebuked what could i do one could not let the man starve his kind-heartedness came out in many ways seeing a short gentleman on one occasion at court straining every joint to obtain a glimpse of the queen he placed him before himself and the little man was so delighted that he asked for a living at a review in the champ de masse he befriended a small boy by mounting him on the back of his own chair obliged to join the french princes the duke consigned the boy to the care of his father and a few days afterwards the father applied for a loan such experiences never narrowed his sympathies his kindness to children is well known georgina dowager lady de ross has told us how he romped with the children and allowed his young guests at walmer to fight the battle of waterloo with him a conflict which began by one of them flinging a cushion at the newspaper he was reading and how indignant he was when he saw that his little favourites had no jam with their bread and butter but the prettiest story is told by lord stanhope two tiny guests at walmer seeing that every one received letters by post wished that they might have some thereupon the duke wrote a little letter to each every morning and had it delivered to them when the post arrived it was a different feeling indeed a sense of justice which made him as constable of the tower give to non-commissioned officers the post of yeoman warder preceding constables following an old usage had sold them one of his latest acts was a serious proposal that the prince consort should command the army through a chief of the staff an obvious error which the prince had the prudence to set aside in the year when it was made eighteen fifty a little prince was born on may first the duke's birthday the name of arthur was bestowed on him and king william of prussia and the duke were the sponsors the next year at the opening of the first exhibition as the queen records the old duke and anglesey walked arm in arm in the procession which was a touching sight another year passed and then the duke faded peacefully away at walmer in september and after lying in state at chelsea hospital was solemnly buried by the side of nelson in st paul's cathedral all the nations in europe except austria were represented at his grave and as the organ peals ceased and the mighty multitude separated the whole world felt not only that an epoch had visibly ended but that a great captain and a supremely dutiful honest man leaving behind him a stainless record had gone from among them for ever the end end of section seventeen recording by pamela nagami in encino california two thousand and seventeen end of wellington by george hooper